So thanks very much, Nikki, for um, having a conversation with me today. We've been lucky enough to interact um, both formally and informally on a research um, trip that we did recently, um, and then within the university. But it's nice to get this opportunity to sort of just have a short, dedicated space to talking about some of the things that really interest us. Okay. So thank you. No problem. Um, I'd like to start with asking you what was it that motivated or drew you to the idea of internationalization? I, I mean, like, like a lot of people's careers, I think you, you sort of, some of it is intentional and some of it is happenstance or serendipity or whatever. Um, I was working at a university in the U.S. and um, became involved in a large international education project. And that was really what got me particularly interested in it. But I think I felt like I had found my niche because I had been working in higher education in various um, positions. But with a background in geography and that, you know, sort of deeply held interest in, in all things global that, um, you know, that I, I've had that since I was since I was a kid, really. So the opportunity then to work on this internationalization project um, sort of made me realize that, that that was very important in higher education. Um, and I felt like I could contribute something to that. So that's where it started. And it's morphed over the years. I mean, started as one discrete project, if you will. And I was in an almost like a project management um, role at that point. And then moving to the Office for Global um, Education and Research at a large US university and getting more involved in coordinating and facilitating and supporting the development of new initiatives. Um, most of which focus on research, um, though also working with students. So, and eventually coming back to Northern Ireland and having the opportunity to do that here. So it's, it's, it's been a series of things. It's not mm. been any one particular thing, but I, I do keep going back to my love of geography and um, you know, global studies, um, which I studied here at Queen's. So I sort of feel like I've gone full circle, no pun intended. So what do you think it was that initially drew you to the study of geography? You're from Northern Ireland. My family background with my father being a ship captain meant that we traveled a lot, so there was that was a huge um, influence for sure, having the opportunity to, as a you know relatively young child, start traveling and seeing other cultures when you know before the days of cheap flights, before the days of, of um, you know the, the long haul travel that everyone does and the, the year out and you know all of the things that 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 young people have the chance to do now. I, most of my friends went to Donegal for their summer holidays, or which was lovely too, but because of my dad's position, we, we went to far-flung places, including you know Saudi Arabia. And, I mean, places that you just wouldn't have been going to typically. So um, I think that, seeing other cultures, realizing that people live very differently um, and being really interested in that. And then, um, after I did come to Queen's to study that, doing a lot of coursework in environmental side of geography, so um, really looking at impacts of things like you know, global warming. Back then we were talking about greenhouse effect and things like that, um, ozone hole in the ozone layer and so on, acid rain, and now of course that's all you know, evolving to be um, climate change. And, um, but the, the impact that as a human population that we were having on our environment and, and how we were going to deal with those issues that were inevitable with population growth. And how, how were we going to feed all those people? How were we going to, I mean, just things like access to water, you know. So that, I think that just drove me in this direction. And then working with researchers now, so dealing with those kinds of issues, but obviously supporting researchers to do the cutting edge work that needs to be done to, to try and find solutions. And so I think the, the whole global challenge piece, you know, is interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. 
I mean, in a way, you're you're gonna answer the second question, which I'm First. going to ask. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. I mean, this is the nature of a conversation, mm. right? It's sort of organic and makes sense. One way, one thing leads to another. But why do you think the issue of internationalization, if 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 you can call it an issue, mm. is important in higher education? I think it's important for several reasons. Um, and the one that I just touched on is the one that I probably have the most involvement in in my job now, which is, um, you know, undertaking the research that needs to be um, needs to be done to try and address these major global challenges um, around issues of food security, climate change, you know, access to water, access to natural resources. Um, Pollution. I mean, all of these things that are that do not respect boundaries, don't respect national borders, and they are entirely transnational in their impact. And I, you know, I think um, that we need the best minds working on that, and we need researchers working on those issues, um, if you will, from both sides of the border. You know, I mean, it, it, you can't you can't work on those issues in isolation. This has to be um, an international collective effort. Um, so that, I think, is really important. But the other piece of it, and maybe I do less of that in my current role, but I think it's extremely important, and I've been involved in before, which is preparing our students, you know, whether they're undergraduates who are going to leave and go into the, you know, into the workplace at the end of their bachelor's degree or whether they go on to be a graduate student who becomes a future researcher, they need to be able to work internationally. Um, you, know, you don't take a job with a local company and stay in it for 30 years anymore and even if you had that, um, you know, even if that was your career path, you're still on Skype, you're still doing go to meeting, you're still traveling to other parts of the world to you know, negotiate financial deals or whatever. It may not be that you're particularly focused on the, the big sort of global challenges, but you still have to be able to work internationally. You still need to be able to understand cultural differences and to navigate those um, and to recognize that you take your own culture with you and that um, you know, the students need to be prepared for that. They're not growing up in the same world that we grew up in, or that are certainly not that our parents grew up in. So you have to, you have to be able to move, you have to be able to be mobile, and you have to be able to be flexible. And I think that's incredibly important for for the the student body. Mm -hmm. So international experiences throughout their throughout their years, whether it's internationalizing your curriculum, whether it's having a study abroad experience whether it's maybe having an international research experience, even a you know, short summer program, or I mean, if it's going to work in a camp in the US for the summer, you know, even that non or non-curricular experience, but that, that opens your mind to how other people work. Mm. So I think that's really important. Mm. I was gonna actually ask you about something about that because I know from our conversations that we've had before that some of the international student work that you did mm. wasn't only in terms of preparing them for um, the workplace, which is sort of an instrumental value, right. but really around the sort of um, cultural awareness yeah. of yeah. being in different places. Yeah, I think we, you know, it's very, um, it's it, it's it's quite a um, challenge to recognize your own sort of cultural biases and, and the baggage that you bring with you and I worked I was lucky enough to work with students um, over the years looking at that sort of intercultural dialogue and intercultural competency and what it is that we bring into the room and what we need to be aware of the projections the, the things that we project from our culture um, and it's not that you ever want to suppress your own culture. You don't want to, um, you know, you don't want to just sort of. I'm always, I've always been very proud to come from Northern Ireland, even though I've lived in many other places. And I, it, it concerns me that my accent has changed a little bit because of influences from other places. Because I'm proud to be from here, mm -hmm. but I'm also very aware that, um, you know, you have to modify your expectations and you have to be 
you, know, you have to be aware of who you are and what you bring to the table. So I think that's a really interesting experience for students. Um, and quite often, there's a, there's a sort of a, we, we use some tools to look, um, to, to um, assess students who had, who did a longer term, you know, international experience as part of their program. And it was quite disconcerting at first because they were actually, they actually came out on this scale of this assessment tool as more culturally competent before they left and less culturally competent when they came back and you think, okay, what's gone wrong? But actually when we did focus groups and talked to them, really what was happening was that they became aware mm. during their international experience of the challenges and some of their, not incompetencies, but some of the things that they needed to work on as individuals to be able to you know, move between cultures a little bit more. Um, you know, so flexibly. almost more reflexive in a way. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And it was like it was a it was a learning experience for them. And suddenly they came in and they came back and realized, yeah, I'm not quite as culturally competent as I thought I was, and I have to work on this. And I think that's that actually was a really good outcome. Mm -hmm. Although initially the backsliding on the scale didn't you know, <laughs> well, wasn't so encouraging. <laughs> yeah. So thanks so much. I mean, you've spoken about two particular areas of internationalization, which is really interesting. Um, having um, both um, researched in this area and spent a considerable amount of your adult life in terms of uh, as a practitioner in higher education around mm -hmm. internationalization, what what do you think from your from your perspective are some of the gaps or areas which you think might be addressed <coughs> by by studies or by practitioners in higher education? I, I, let me put my hat on, you know, in terms of the research work that I, the work I do to support the researchers. I think one of the biggest challenges that we have is um, to, to break down those silos between disciplines that have to be um, broken down in order to address the big challenges. We need social scientists and medical life scientists and physical scientists working together to address these challenges. And it's not necessarily a comfort zone for a lot of people, first and foremost. Um, it's a challenge because our disciplines may all speak the one language in terms of you know English, but our languages within the disciplines are very different. So I spent a year working with a group of researchers and we focused for most of that time on the definition of the word resilience and what that meant to different disciplines and how they could come together around a project that involved resilience. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done to bring the disciplines together around you know, these big challenges. I also think that structurally um, it's really difficult because for researchers, there are so many competing pressures on their time, on their what, how they are assessed. You know, um, assessed in terms of their research output, and are they publishing in the best journals? And those journals tend to be very disciplinarily focused. You know, the law, the interdisciplinary journals don't necessarily uh, aren't necessarily perceived to be of as high a standard. So we have a sort of a whole culture around that within uh, within disciplines that you know you're encouraged to really publish and work in your discipline, mm -hmm. but we can't address these large problems if we don't step outside those discipline boundaries and you know work or, or at least work across them. So I think that is a huge challenge for us. I think I, I'm hopeful that the next generation of researchers are going to be more comfortable in those spaces. You see. You know, if you look at graduate programs now, or postgraduate programs, sorry, um, you see a lot more effort. And here in the graduate school, they have great programs that are helping students work in interdisciplinary teams. And there is a lot more of that um, in, in their training or in their preparation at this point. So I'm hopeful that that is something that, you know, gradually we're moving toward a culture that is, is where that's more the norm. Um, but I still think structurally underpinning it, we've got to make some changes where researchers are valued 
for those contributions as they are for their contributions to their own you know, mm. particular individual discipline. Um, and I think it comes down to communication. You know, I mean, whether it's the language breakdowns and you know, between disciplines, the, the communication, understanding what the pressures are. And you know, I'm, I suppose, you know, the first, my first part of this response is very focused on our researchers here. But take that and multiply it when you start working across borders. So you and I have just come back from South Africa and you know, you know the system there much better than I do. But it was really instructive to travel there with a group of our researchers and understand what pressures our colleagues in South Africa are under and how they might be worried about different aspects of assessment than our researchers are. And we can't enter into a big joint research project together that's going to take a lot of people's time and effort and resources of both universities um, here and a, and a partner in South Africa without acknowledging mm -hmm. what the researchers are, are dealing with from their perspectives, you know, uh, the, the teaching pressures, the research pressures, the publication pressures. So there's, that has to be communicated and it has to, I, I think we are often quite poor about doing that up front. I mean, I even hear researchers, when, when we become aware of arguments about publication and who goes, you know, who's the lead author on things, and you think, well, shouldn't that have been, you know, negotiated kind of in the early stages? And, and most often it's not <laughs> the way, uh, though it should be. So if that's not even being addressed early on in the conversation about a research project, then you can, you can bet that the discussions about all these other things are not really being had either. We're all excited about the project. Mm -hmm. We're worried about where we can find the money. How logistically can we make this happen? But all of this other contextual information is not necessarily being communicated. So I think we, we're under a lot of pressure um, or the researchers are under a lot of pressure and by default our teams are under a lot of pressure to move quickly and bring money in and, and find opportunities to work together um, and somehow we need to find more time to think and talk and build a relationship and that's, I mean I suppose I'm hoping that the types of things that we're doing now with the South Africa trip they may not come to fruition immediately um, they'll take time and I think that's the other challenge in this area mm. is the timelines and the amount of time that it takes to do international work you know, uh, just in terms of, of course of on flight and things like that time zone differences but actually you need more time to build a relationship you need more time to develop a mutual understanding of the research topic and, and negotiate who's going to do what and how it's going to be managed and how you know internally that work is going to flow and that's hard to find in the current environment where everybody's under pressure to to move quickly to respond to calls yeah and those calls come out incredibly short time we have one i was just talking about this morning the call documents were published and a week later the um, applications were due and the decisions were being made a week after that yeah now, it wasn't strictly a research call, but still, it's an yeah. international, and it's a call to, um, that involves doing international work. And if the, and particularly if there's a push to build connections, um, as I know there is in the Global South with institutions that have been previously disadvantaged, mm -hmm. then you need those conditions to be established. You can't sort of depend on the easy routes that have been happening a long right. time, you know, within... And that's, I think, we go back to that cultural assumption, you know, we cannot, you can't enter into discussions and negotiations with potential partners in other parts of the world without understanding that, you know, their, the, the culture of how they came into existence and what they have, you know, where, how they are where they are has to be taken into consideration. You can't land in an African country and assume that they have a fully developed research office or that they have, you know, certain facilities and so on. You, that all needs to be discussed and understood. And we, you know, I think researchers from the Global North 
have to be very um, aware of that and they need to listen to their counterparts. I still see, you know, occasionally we still see a little bit of that sort of colonial um, attitude, you know, if we're coming from a big institution in the US or in the UK and we have an understanding and we, of this issue. But people on the ground living the issue have a much better understanding of what it's the just as valid, right? Yeah, so yeah. the idea of co-creating the research is something that's quite um, is is relatively new, I would say, and I think that that's again that requires time, right? You can't wait until a research call or a call for funding comes out and to sit down with your partners and start having those conversations because. You, you know, you only have a few weeks, but you have to have had the conversation. Like, what is the, what are the challenges that that you would you know agree to work on together? Mm -hmm. What would be those mm -hmm. research questions? And it's not necessarily just with researchers anymore either. And I think that's a new new direction for mm -hmm. a lot of researchers. These projects might involve communities. They might mm -hmm. involve non-governmental organizations. They might involve policymakers from the local governments that need to be at the table, contributing to the discussions at the beginning, the design of the project, and that are probably the most important people when it comes to delivering long-term impact and sustainability. They are the ones that are actually going to take the, the work. If they're invested in it from yes. the beginning, there's far yeah. more chance they'll be receptive later. Absolutely. Yeah. So those are, again, you know, it's all those conversations where maybe yeah. researchers two generations ago were, you know, worked in their offices or their laboratories, maybe quite isolated and didn't have to have this level of engagement that they have to have now. And I guess also those who did have international projects in times past may have also had a whole lot more autonomy and not yeah. being quite so aware of how they were going to be assessed yeah. as individuals and yeah. that the current climate has. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely, and it's, it's very different in different countries and mm. I think that's something that I've certainly become more aware of in the last few years. Um, moving back to the UK, having lived and worked somewhere else for a long time and then travelling to other countries, you know, going to China and at the end of the week and I'm, you know, what, what, what kinds of structural, you know, concerns are there for our Chinese partners? What, what's important to them in terms of how they progress through their career and their system. You know, otherwise we propose some things and it's, it, these are things that, that don't have value for them or mm -hmm. they can't count or they, you know. So as much as you don't want to be driven by the, the REF and other systems, you have to acknowledge that researchers are dealing with that. So you, you, have, to, you have to educate yourself about it because otherwise you know, you're asking people to do things that are outside of their focus. Well, what's interesting about academic mobility is that it isn't a world about the common good, really. Yeah. And even as academics move from one space to another, they experience these shifting yeah. senses of what's valued or not in yeah. higher education, yeah. which is a really interesting thing. It's a, I think it's proliferated. Yeah. Um, much more um, clearly in the last 20 years or so. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think for for students now, like the students in your course, you know, they the need to understand those different systems. 20 years ago, I don't think that was really of, of any great importance or was, wasn't given a lot of importance, but now it's, I think that's critical. I think you have to understand, you know, different approaches to things internationally and it could be in coursework, it could be in research, you know, it, but, you, but you need to really, mm -hmm. you know, that comparative or, um, it's a comparative makes it sound like, you're com you know, like one's better than the other and I don't mean that, but, you know, the understanding of how things are, are different and how and where they are the same, mm -hmm. you know. Context is very, very important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Thanks so much, Nikki. Yeah. Um, I really appreciate this and I hope that at another point in time we'll get another chance to yeah, chat again. Thank you.